Our next speaker is gonna be Dr. Terry Hauser. He got his master's and PhD here at Iowa State. He went and taught at University of Florida for a little bit before going to Kansas State to teach and then came back here to Iowa State where he is a Smithville Chair in Meat Science Extension as well. So please give me a hand and welcome, welcome Dr. Terry Hauser. Great job, guys. Great job. All right, we're going to talk about bacon quality. I can't believe we don't have a full room, Sherry, but we're going to work with what we got, right? We got the important people in here. So uh, as we stated earlier, I was at Kansas State for 13 years where we did some, a, a lot of work on bacon. In fact, probably our group and then Dr. Bowler's group over at Illinois before he went to work for industry probably did the most work in the bacon area. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, here at Iowa State, we're continuing that work, but we're gonna, just going to go through kind of what, the, what the, uh, the bacon market looks like in the food service area and tell you why that's important today. Now, if you've been in these sessions the last two, they were very scientific. This one is going to not hit that kind of bar, Roy. It's going to be a little more so we can understand it, right? Okay, um, it's interesting we have this data uh, for the average price of sliced bacon over a two year, 10 year period between 2007 and 17 is, was up 57%. Uh, look, just looked the other day, and, and fun fact, your tax dollars from the US uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, they keep track of what a pound of bacon nationally costs every month. Okay, so you can look this number up. We're at right now about 750 a pound nationally this year. Now, the last couple of years, of course, probably is not fair to put that information in because it's a little bit wonky, right? But <clears throat> clearly, we can see that the popularity of bacon is increasing. Boy, for the pork producers in here, we wish this was happening with every other cut we sell because it is not, right? We've got some pretty cheap hams and, and, uh, and loins. So. If we were to look at this over a longer period of time, Dr. Gabler, they've been keeping track of this since 1980. If you were able to invest in a stock that tracked this, your stock would have went up 360% since 1980. So bacon, it's, it's one of those things that works for us, right? Today we're gonna talk about aerobic packaging styles because that's how food service generally uses bacon. It's in what we call a, a layout style and we'll tell you why that is the case. You're familiar with when you go to hy V, you buy this stuff that's anaerobically packaged or vacuum packaged. Well, as many of you know, if you've been sitting at the stove on a Saturday morning trying to peel those slices apart, sometimes they don't come apart too easy. So food service, this, this packaging format known as the slice layout, this is the most popular uh, way to, sh to sell uh, bacon to a restaurant. These sheets allow us to take that entire that entire sheet of bacon and put it on right on top of a flat top grill. If it cooks a little bit, anybody ever cooked bacon with one of these? You can pull that sheet of paper off. It's very, very easy to use. Okay, so if you go into a Denny's or someplace like that, uh, you're gonna see them use this type of packaging format. In addition, it's way less expensive than if we're gonna vacuum package every one, okay? In addition to that, uh, we're going to get a lot less slice adhesion. So we don't have that problem pulling those things apart, right? And those slices apart in the back of the restaurant. So this is the primary style that my research has been focused on. And it's because we got about 50% or 40 some percent pre-pandemic of the bacon that we were utilizing in the United States was in food service, right? Now my family raises beef cattle and everybody asks me, why do I do bacon research? And I tell them, that bacon has sold more beef than all of the money with the be entire beef check off in the entirety of its existence. So bacon sells beef too, so there you go. All right, a couple, several years ago now we were asked, uh, Mike Tokash and I were asked to put together a literature review for the Reciprocal Meat Conference in, uh, in Fargo, North Dakota. The question asked is how do DDGs affect belly quality, okay? In, the, in, those, in that literature review, basically what, what we found was we found no published research that had statistical differences between iodine value, okay? And so that might surprise many of you in here, right? Surprise many of you in here because we often link the two. We often link the IV value to poor bacon quality, okay? It really depends on how we how we define bacon quality. Is that slice yield? Is it taste? Is it flavor? Is it storability? Is it 
microbial uh, growth over time. So that's really hard to kind of drill down to. So in the published literature, we really, really couldn't find anything that we could really point to, other than the supposed poor slice yield um, situation that, that can occur if you don't process them correctly. You can, get a, you can, you can slice a pretty soft belly, you just got to get cold and you can slice it. So, uh, so, so that was interesting to a lot of people. They were like, oh, wait a second, Terry. There's no way that's the case. Well, that's, okay, that's the literature, all right? I don't, I don't make it, I just, I just report it, right? At least in that. Over time, we've had a lot of concerns with fat quality, and by the way, this is not a bash on distiller's talk, but here are some of the reasons that we have, uh, have suspected that, that that fat wasn't as high a quality. We get lower, melt lower melting points as we unsaturate those, those products, which makes them just hard to work with, right? They don't, they don't manufacture the same as our, our harder bellies or our harder fats. And the reason why is because we often have to switch to cheaper feed sources, right? Right now is an excellent example where we have extremely high feed costs across the board. So we're gonna go out and we're gonna look for whatever we can put in that diet to make it cheaper. And a lot of times that doesn't do our fat quality for pigs very, very much good because they are what they eat, right? So we've been doing this a long time uh, as far as studying this. But some of the things that we, we've said about, uh, about uh, fat quality is, well, maybe there's, a, maybe there's a poor slicing yield. Well, Oscar Meyer did a whole bunch of work in that area and they never really could, over hundreds and hundreds of bellies, never really couldn't nail that down once the bellies were properly managed, meaning tempered. Um, but the bottom one here was, is there possible oxidation issues? Well, it would make sense if we have more unsaturated fat that we're going to have more oxidation. That's just intuitive. Fish are less saturated than, say, chicken and, and beef and lamb. Okay, well, they have more problems with oxidation. So that, that makes sense to us, Roy, but it doesn't really happen that way. Well, we did a study um, that we'll, we'll talk about here in a minute, but for, does everybody know what iodine value is? We won't go into that if everybody knows. Okay, all right, we're gonna skip over that. But basically we're gonna report that in grams per 100 grams. Um, that was a traditional method we used by titrating iodine into fat to see what the saturation level is. Now we use GC to determine that and report that uh, with an equation that we use, a standardized equation we use. So that exact question was asked, hey, Mike and I, Mike Tokash and I, told everybody, hey, there's no published literature that says iodine value impacts belly quality in the face of everybody telling us it does. Okay, I'm just telling you that's what the published research. So out of that, the National Pork Board funded a project that I did at Kansas State University that looked at exactly that. Now, when we talked to many of our packer friends, they said, hey, this oxidation issue is worse than food service bacon, okay, because it is in an oxygen permeable environment. That would make sense to us, right? Okay, so in collaboration with uh, Roger Johnson, which at the time, many of you know Roger, was at, uh, was at Farmland still. Um, he and I and, and, and the folks at the Pork Board designed a project to kind of look at this. So what we did, we did is we used two different packaging types, aerobic and anaerobic packaging, stored over 120 days, and then with three iodine value, we had basically a high, a medium, and low of what was in the plant at the time, okay? So, if this is the data from that project, uh, we have the number of animals, hot carcass weight, uh, our average IV. This was taken with a knit farm. Uh, some of you are familiar with that. Uh, over, the, over the top of the shoulder, that's where that information, that's what that IV corresponds to. As many of you know, a belly IV value, or wherever we take that iodine value, it can change. These are not absolute values, so uh, we can get some differences there. So we had some spread between our iodine values, okay? Um, when we actually took the, we actually made bacon out of these, pressed them, actually made them in a commercial plant, pressed those bellies, sliced them, um, took a, uh, a aggregated sample. Hey, Stevie Ray, how you doing? Good, I'm doing good. Um, we took an aggregated sample there, and then we reported what the actual iodine value was for that belly, okay, across the entire belly. We know, we know there's differences between dorsal and, and, uh, and uh, ventral and anterior and posterior, but this is just the average. So we did, again, 
We did get some differences. We didn't see as much spread in the bottom as we thought we were, but anyway, that's the data. All right, nothing really uh, all that groundbreaking here. We also looked at the fatty acid profiles. Again, as you would expect, we have uh, more uh, stearic acid and uh, in, in the other, uh, and, and palmitic acid in our uh, low iodine value compared to our high iodine value. Okay, it all, all the story matches up. Our, our bellies match the story that we're, we're, say, we're, we're telling. Um, I put this slide in here because some of you may not be aware of the assay that we use to determine oxidation in meat products. This is the most popular one that we, can, we use in academics anyhow, and that's the T-bars test or thiobarbituric acid reactive substances. And what we're measuring with that is our free aldehydes, alcohols, and ketones that are, ma that are made during lipid oxidation of that fat over time. As you see here, we use a colorimetric method, uh, which we actually distill. Um, we get a supernatant off a of distillation of boiling the product. We then uh, react it with, uh, with our T TBA solution, and we get a nice pink uh, color it, the, the more oxidation we have. Okay, so. So what did we find in that experiment? We had, uh, we had uh, basically, we looked at the high intermediate and low iodine values across both packaging types over all storage days. We stored them from zero to 120 days in zero degrees F uh, fr fr frozen temperatures. That's typically where we see food service distribution have their temperatures in that range. And what we saw when we, as, a, as the main effect is, we didn't see any difference in iodine the effect of iodine value did not make a difference, okay? That's kind of surprising. Okay, yeah, maybe there's a little bit here, but not statistically, right? Okay, here's what we did find, though. Not surprisingly, when we add oxygen to the system, we get a lot more oxidation, okay? We could probably all said that might have happened. Um, yeah, pr pretty drastic uh, increase, and again, didn't seem to matter if it was a high IV or low IV. Now, again, it really kind of depends on how much spread you have, right? We're not really calling these really high IV. Some of you guys are point, kind of probably pointing that out. We're not talking about 90 or 100, okay? Uh, and that's another, another ball of wax, too. So we didn't really see any effect there, and we didn't see it on the anaerobic ones, okay? But this was what was really interesting to us. When we separated them by anaerobic, uh, aer or anaerobic by anaerobic, we see that we see a very quick increase in T-bars values for aerobic packaged products. If we go back in the literature, we generally think of 1.0 milligrams per gram as our level, or kilogram, milligrams per kilogram, as our level of determining or that we could uh, detect oxidation. So this is kind of an important line, although I would tell you bacon has a lot of fat in it, so that line probably is a little too low, Steve. Uh, it's probably closer to one and a half or somewhere in here. But the moral of the story is, though, I think what people didn't realize is how quick this happens in an, in an aerobic environment. And it it, we will show you many sets of data, and it happens in every one of those unless we stabilize that fat. So that was, pre that was a pretty interesting deal. Um, I thought to myself, man, it can't get bad that fast. But anecdotally, when, when I've been to locker plants and got product that's packaged in white paper, it seems like that, that bacon goes bad this, this quick. If you've had a fair pig slaughtered, you brought the bacon home, if you didn't eat it right away, all of a sudden it doesn't taste right, that's the same process we're talking about. So, again, uh, not surprising we can get some shelf life out of a product that has anaerobic packaging, not so much with aerobic. And uh, I think it kind of took some folks... Uh, by surprise that we're having this. Although Lowe and others, if you know Brad Lowe, uh, worked with uh, Dustin Bowler there at Illinois, he showed some similar things. This is not with, with T-bars, but definitely uh, with off flavor and off odor, uh, in, these, uh, these products increase over time. You'll note that his storage temperature was much colder than the ones we've been storing them at. That is one of those factors that accelerates that lipid oxidation. So we've got some antibiotics, antioxidants that we could, potentially add to meat products. They're not normally added to bacon. Bacon has been one of those that people have kept their hands out of. We don't add BHA, BHA BHT, any of that kind of thing. But these are, these are commonly used in pork sausage. I mean, they're, they're everyday kind of antioxidants. We also have some that are, show up naturally in the environment uh, of which we process products. One of those 
one of those resources is smoke. Okay, so when we smoke a, a belly or, uh, or we add liquid smoke to a brine, we can directly add some of these others, such as creosol and syringol. Those are some major phenolic compounds that are, that are associated with those products. So we can also measure them by GC, okay? So we can quantify them. As far as herbs go, uh, herbs and spices, we can also add rosemary. That's a very popular one. Green tea is also another popular one now. We're using that uh, in a, a lot of our pork sausage that we're making in this country, uh, bratwurst and those kind of things. So those are, those are being used in other areas. So the thought would be, um, can we use some of these antioxidants we use in other parts to stabilize uh, the fat in an, in an HRI bacon? And, and what we did, uh, so we did, a, we did a study on that. Basically, we were taking uh, each belly, belly, bellies incidentally, Steve's done some belly work uh, when he was in graduate school here. One of the most frustrating things about bellies, Steve, right, is they're so variable, right? It's really hard to get a good experimental design. So one of the, one, one of the things we've been doing is we've actually just been splitting the belly so that we, we don't have to pair those with you know, both sides of the pig. We can just take one belly and cut it, cut it down the middle and have an anterior and posterior section. That has been a very, very good way to do these kinds of studies. Now, it doesn't work for everything we do, but certainly when we're going to add an ingredient, it, it can work that way. So <clears throat> one of the first studies we did, we actually added a product called smoked sugar. We, this, this is... I guess it's basically liquid, well, it's basically liquid smoke added to sugar to get around labeling, if you really want to know how that works, right? Uh, it's a, a carry product, Red Arrow makes it. Uh, we can add it directly to a brine, although we could add that on a label as smoke sugar added rather than liquid smoke. And if you talk to bacon enthusiasts, they do not want to see liquid smoke, but I don't think they have any problem with saying you smoke sugar, right, Steve? All right. So we added them to the brine, um, we did T-bars, we did GCMS, and we also did a trained a sensory panel, which was kind of really unique about this study. And, and why I say it's unique is these, all three things measure oxidation, but we haven't seen that all piled into one study. So um, it, it was very unique in that way. In addition, it was unique in the fact, well, it, it's unique in the fact that people are very critical of T-bars at times. And they say, well, they don't explain enough. So we wanted to be able to say, are T-bars um, realistic as far as a predictor of what people would find in a trained sensory panel? And, and so we did the work, okay? So here, this is at Kansas State, uh, as you can tell, the purple hard hats at the time. Uh, here are some of the products we were looking for. Uh, as you, many of you may or may not know, uh, Dr. Ahn at Iowa State has done a ton of work in the oxidation area. Uh, we were beat to death with that when we were in grad school, Steve and I. And so he aldehydes, right? Those are the ones, those are the, the products we're looking for, hexanol uh, being the big one. So we went ahead and we measured hexanol, heptanol, and, and nonanol. Uh, we also looked at creosol and syringol. I told you they were phenolic compounds, right? They are found in smoke. We can quantify them in actual just so, uh, uh, natural smoke that we make with sawdust. So we looked for those, all right? Now, we did trained sensory evaluation. We looked at the following components. Uh, the, the big one we looked at was this oxidative flavor intensity, and, but there's some other cool stuff we found along the way as well. So basically, we added smoked sugar to these products, and here, here's what we found. For some of you who do... Uh, that have done some composition work, not surprising to you, the uh, anterior portion of a belly is fatter than the posterior belt part, right? Pigs fatten from front to rear, they, that's the way bellies work as well. Uh, moisture and protein follow that. Iodine value is a little bit higher in the anterior versus the posterior. When we look at the T-bars results, again, see all these nice cuvettes under there? Glad I didn't have to do that. Glad that a grad student did that, right? Okay, um, here, this, this one should look a little familiar to you should have looked a lot like the first graph. As you see here in our control that didn't, didn't have an antioxidant, what happened? It had rapid increase in T-bars values after about day 20, okay? If we look in the product that had an antioxidant, it was, it was pretty solid uh, over the entire storage time. Uh, in fact, we, we went and cooked some of this bacon almost two years later and it still wasn't bad, okay? Uh, so. So clearly supports the theory, hey, why don't we put an antioxidant in our bacon? The 
depend, and there's lots of different products we can use for that. Our G, so that was our, t, that was our T bars. Okay, so what happens with our other two uh, assays? Our GCMS shows hexanol increases over time. All right. Some of the others weren't quite as good at detecting it as I would have hoped, but hexanol was solid. High, hexanol has got a very high relationship to, uh, to uh, determine oxidative stability uh, in other literature. We also looked at what this creosol and syringol. Those were the two products we added. What we, what we see here is, guess what? These other, these other control bellies, they've been smoked, guys, in the smokehouse. They have creosol and syringol. They just have a little less. But more importantly, it's where that creosol and syringol is. It's actually this stuff on the treatment side. That's all in the middle of the slice. So when it's exposed to air, it can react and help protect it. So it's not like we don't have them, uh, or we're really adding that much more. It's just the placement of those, uh, those uh, particular phenolic compounds. So here we, here we have the sensory results. So, so far, we've had our T-bars back up that we have an oxidation issue and that we can solve it. We also have our GCMS that tells us the same thing. And then, then, we, then we have this data right here. Uh, that, that will show us that we have a rapid increase in oxidation, as we've seen in all our other, other analytical uh, tests, with the control we do, don't have with the, the product with an antioxidant, okay? So, clear uh, data to show us that. There's a couple other things that were kind of cool about it. We got more bacon flavor intensity, smoke, and saltiness, uh, which you just have more um, aromatic type of volatiles in there, just makes everything else uh, kind of pop on that product. In, the, in conclusion of that study, we basically, we saw that when we add, boil it down, when we add an antioxidant, we can help control that. On the flip side, if you're making food service bacon without an antioxidant, you got problems, and you need to address them, okay? Because that, that stuff tastes terrible. I mean, if anybody's been to an IHOP or Denny's or you, the best one, uh, our, our sensory lady said, how do you explain what oxidized bacon t smells like? And she said, well, when you walk into, the, when you walk into a Denny's and that, that smell hits you, that's what oxidized bacon smells like. I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure she's wrong. Okay. <clears throat> we also did a similar study, and this one won't take very long, where we added it to a, a natural or an alternatively cured brine. So alternative cured products who, use, who get their nitrite from celery have been very, very popular. So we wanted to do it in that system because we're talking about a very different pH of our, our brine solution and, and how much nitrite we have in this system. There's probably a lot of these, these products that have probably less than 80 part per million because of the cost of the product, okay? So we did the same thing, measured pretty much the same thing, we, except for we didn't do GC on this one because my grad student got real tired of doing those. Uh, but we did T-bars and, 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 uh, and trained sensory evaluation again. Pretty similar graph, right? So we've only done this experiment now. We have another one that we did. We've done it four times. We get the same thing every single time. Bacon rapidly oxidizes in the presence of oxygen when put in a freezer, period. End of story. If you put something in there to stabilize it, it'll stabilize it. So, uh, and again, same kind of sensory, in it, sensory results. Okay, this brings me to what are we going to do? What are we doing now? What are we doing in, in the near future? This is a problem that, we, that food, the food service bacon industry, I hope, addresses and just goes ahead and spends a couple cents a pound that's going to take to fix it. We still don't know. So, Roy, if you're following along, which you're watching that spread in IV values, I said that there, we found still no difference. Well, that doesn't tell the whole story because it's not a wide enough, right? Some of you may have, may have been thinking of that. So we're, we're working on, now we're going to work on the ends. So we actually have two studies funded by Iowa Pork. One of those is looking at a broader range of IVs. And if any of you have been in a plant lately, you can find really bad bacon now. It, we, we're, we're having a hard time finding it during the pandemic because we slowed pigs down. That is not the case now. We can find plenty of soft bellies at this, at this point in time. So we're, we're doing that, we're looking at an IV again, and, and then we're going to look at a different class of antioxidants. So whenever we put smoke or add liquid smoke on a label, consumers and processors really don't care for that. So the, the smoke sugar deal may or may not fit everybody. 
So we wanted to put something that maybe sounded a little better. So we're, we're putting a rosemary green tea in. That's been pretty well accepted on a label. And, and we're looking at that, that project right now. So but that one is a, is a three by two factorial looking at uh, you know, the antioxidant versus the iodine value. So we're trying to split them up again. Uh, no doubt our, our iodine values will be higher on this set of pigs because the bellies were a lot worse than we've been using. In addition to that, color stability in retail bacon. Is it, do any of you buy your bacon out of the full service case? Okay. Do any of you notice how poor the color is on that bacon many times? I mean, some of it's really bad. So we're, we're looking at finding ways to mitigate that and let, make that color hold up better. Because whether we like it or not, we're getting more bacon in to sell in full service and, and generally just other products, right? People, it is, there's more margin in that for the companies like hy or Fairway than if you just buy it in the, in, in the uh, self-serve. So as we sell more bacon in full service, we're going to need to work on the color stability of that over time. Uh, a couple of them, Steve would probably think this is a pretty good one. Some basic antimicrobial work on bacon. There is a lot of sour bacon in the market. If you, if you buy some and it don't smell quite right, it gets real sour. I don't know. We need to do something in that area, Steve. Probably, you know, maybe do some with your company on that, kind of stabilize that. And then, obviously, we still have this alternatively cured deal. Um, when we add, I don't know if you saw the color of that brine, it almost looks green. Whenever we add that product, we get a lot of color problems just from the greening and the chlorophyll in that deal. Uh, people don't, really don't want green streaks in their bacon. Okay, so they may not want the, the, the nitrite, the chemical nitrite, uh, but they probably don't want it green either. So on that note, we are, again, we're doing two studies uh, currently that are looking at the oxidative stability of bacon. It's interesting because we took a little of the bacon we added the rosemary green tea to, we thawed it out in the case and we took some color measurements and that, that's gonna last longer in the case. We've done that a couple times. We'll probably put in a, a proposal to the pork board to really look at that. But if you can imagine going to Hy-Vee or, or Fairway or, or so, whoever else sells meat in the state of Iowa, uh, and, and looking in their full service case and seeing a lot nicer color on that bacon, it, it can't hurt the sale, I would, I would think. So we're gonna, we're gonna determine that. But there's just not a lot of work with that particular pigment because it's not necessarily all raw and it's not all cooked. So we can't use the same data that we got from looking at ham because we cook it to a much higher temperature and we stabilize the protein a little better. So there's a lot of things that happen with bacon that are just unique because we don't process it to as high a temperature. It doesn't have as much pigment. We don't use as much nitrite, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of stuff we're gonna learn in the, in the near future. With that, that's kind of where we're at with bacon research. Um, I don't know anybody else around the country since Bowler left Illinois that does much with it. So we're it. Questions? Oh. This is always my, one of my favorite quotes I've ever heard anybody say. If you guys know Roger Johnson, many of you do. He, uh, he gave us a talk at one of the RMCs, and that's how he finished up. So I always like using his quote. If, you, if loving bacon is wrong, I don't want to be right. So, questions? We have plenty of time for questions. If good, good question, Roy. Yeah, I think, so when we look at that, all right, so maybe look at that data real quick. Um, if we just look at this deal, these are probably still okay. We didn't do an acceptable versus non because we didn't have enough panelists. That's more of a consumer type of, type of ask. But when we trained, the other thing to keep in mind, when we trained on this 100 point life scale, 100 was product that was two years old with no antioxidants, so it was bad. So that's a really, that, you know, we can't answer necessarily that with the data that we have, Roy, but I would assume that right about somewhere in, in this area, it becomes not acceptable. You can tell, you can taste it, right? So this would be about 30% of the time they're picking it up, I mean, roughly. So now, 
we've had a lot of discussions with our locker owners because many of those guys are still white paper wrapping it. And I'm like, guys, you got to quit doing that. Either vacuum package it or put an antioxidant in it, and that'll, that'll solve your problem. But you can't, you can't ask people to pay the prices they ask. You know, we're talking eight, nine, ten dollar a pound of bacon, and then take it home and it be terrible. So I'm hoping we can kind of make some inroads on that. But we have many people that are buying bellies and, and making them into bacon. It's not just Hormel and, and farmland. And we want that to be as good of an experience as, as possible because, quite frankly, bacon is the ribeye of the pig. I mean, that's the highest price cut we got. Nick. We have not done that work. We've been approached by a few people while I was at K-State to do that, and just just never worked out. And mainly because it's so easy to add in a brine. I mean, we're talking two cents cost in use, which is still money, but um, but we, we hope we're gonna, maybe going to do some of that work. We might see some folks that are feeding higher levels of an antioxidant. And that would be a way to mitigate it for sure. Especially if, if data would tell us, kind of a spoiler alert, if, we, if you look at some of those really high IV values, if you spread the data far enough, you're going to find differences in oxidation. So that begs the question, as diets change, if we, get, if we continue to get fat that's pretty rough around the edges, um, then we probably need something in there to stabilize it. Steve? Do, do you think it's iodine value or specific fatty acids that are more key, right? So even if you have a high iodine value, what's that comprised of? If you tease that out a little bit, I don't know how you'd put it in an experimental model, but... I, cert I, I certainly would, would think you could be right on that, Steve. There could be certain fatty acids that do it. We just haven't. It, it's kind of like a, such a big... We haven't narrowed it up to that, but I, I don't doubt it. I don't know how you do it. Like yeah. It would be cool if you could separate them out. One thing interesting that we, that we were finding, though, in this last set of abilities is the iodine values that we actually calculated were not as bad numerically as the bellies looked. We had some really, really bad bellies that we would have expected to have much higher iodine values. So I don't know how that's being manipulated. Dr. Gabler would probably tell me that there's some, there's some things we can do in the diet that we can make that iodine value better than it, I don't know, make it look better. <laughs> I don't know if that's the case or not, but it really surprised us on some of the last bellies that they weren't worse in number. So, Nick, you got any thoughts on that? Are you under contractual obligation not to say? No. Just kidding. <clears throat> well, yeah, that's in a way that's the real problem. You you can slice. I tell everybody, fat's just an, it's a crystal like ice. You can it, it'll get cold and it'll slice, but it's the sorting them and managing that between so many so much variation in your raw material. We got some of them that you're getting too cold, and then when you run them through a press. When you, when you do that, it's like hitting a piece of ice with a hammer. It shatters, and that's not good. So it's really the consistency issue. We could, you could probably make the argument, and I think this is where, Horm, where Oscar Meyer was running into troubles. They were trying to calculate slice yield off of bellies that were properly tempered. Well, once you properly temper them, you probably won't see a, a difference in slice yield. So uh, that's, a, that's a great question. But whenever we get a wider uh, degree of variation, we'll have more trouble because of the tempering situation. I had a quick question. Yeah. Um, so on the studies that you presented today, the pictures showed that the bacon was singled layer mm -hmm. versus layered. Would you expect much difference if between the two different cost packaging types? When you, when you talk about shingled or, or just pushed together. So there's a platter style HRI that's just basically a belly laying in a box slice this way, right? Is that the kind you're asking about? I think so. Well, I think you're still going to get, you probably will get some protection from that. Mm -hmm. But when we look at bacon, we don't, we don't intentionally pack those really tightly 
because we got to get them back apart. The other, the other problem with HRI bacon, some of you will laugh, sometimes you can, Roger Mandigo used to say, I got a piece of bacon at a Denny's and I could almost read the newspaper through it. HRA bacon many times is sliced thinner than we're going to get in a, in a retail store. So whenever we slice them thin, you really can't put them in that configuration or you'll never get them apart. So uh, that platter style is generally normal to thicker slice type bacon just from the slice adhesion situation. Uh, but uh, show them that, yeah. So you're just talking, not, you're not talking the shingle style. You're, they're, they're, we, we buy bellies also that are just stacked long ways. Anybody else? So you can't vacuum pack the You cannot vacuum package that. Well, you can do anything you want. <clears throat> it, it's going to, we, we do this. And what happens when you put a vacuum package on that is it contorts really badly. Yes, yes, that is exactly right. So um, one of the questions, you know, many, many folks are saying, well, Terry, why don't we just put it in gas flush? Yeah, sure, go right ahead. The only problem is once somebody opens the box, you have no protection. Once you open the gas flush, it's in the environment. So um, I'm sure somebody's doing the math on what's easier, or most cost effective. Certainly ingredients are not, well, one thing is rosemary is pretty much a commodity, so it's cheap compared to some other things. And, uh, that's right. That's right. You got, uh, that's why I do bacon research. We sell more beef that way. <laughs>